Hey everyone, it is Friday. It is time for Friday Forecasting Talks. And today we have uh, an exciting presentation by Bachmann on the topic of uh, temporal aggregations. But as usual, before we move to the presentation, I'll say a couple of words about uh, the center. So, uh, wait a second. So, this is our group. And uh, this is the short list of the services that we provide and the expertise that we have. As you see, we have a variety. I would say that uh, w one of the topics of the main interest in our group is uh, supply chain forecasting and inventory management. So these aspects of demand forecasting, but uh, that's not the only thing that we do. We also investigate machine learning, approaches and so we have some expertise in marketing analytics marketing research methods and there is a lot of ways how to work with us one of the simplest and this is the way that won't cost you anything is a master sum project so if you your company or a colleague of yours have a problem that you want to investigate then master projects would be one of the best ways for doing that because you will have a person that will try out a variety of modern techniques and uh, will help you in resolving that specific problem that you have so this is a short introduction if you want to get keep in touch with us then you have a variety of ways of doing that there is a twitter there's linkedin you can send us an email. Uh, this looks like a slightly outdated way of communicating in these days, but we are still here. Um, and then there is a website or our YouTube channel. So there is a variety. Choose one if you want to get in touch with us. Now over to Bachmann. Bachmann, maybe you can start sharing your screen and introduce yourself. OK. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be here um, and today we're going to talk about uh, temporal aggregation uh, and temporal aggregation in time series forecasting. So my name is uh, Bahman and I'm um, a reader in management science at uh, Cardiff Business School. Um, and this is the outline of what I'm going to cover today. So I will start my presentation by looking at temporal aggregation why we need temporal aggregation in time series forecasting and what are the common approaches. Um, I think we, it's like an introduction to the topic of temporal aggregation. So some of you, you might be familiar with this, but uh, there are different terminologies actually used in this area. And sometimes these terminologies might be confusing. So we are trying to clarify um, these terminologies in that part. And following that, um, I go and uh, uh, explore M4 um, competition data set and I look at the performance of temporal aggregation and M4 competition data and then I will um, explore two different questions. Um, as you can see, they are actually working papers. So in the first uh, working paper, I investigate whether combining different temporal aggregation approach can improve forecast accuracy or not and how to combine different approaches in temporal aggregation. And in the second working paper, um, I look at the time series future, uh, time series features or characteristics and how temporal aggregation changes the features of time series and whether uh, we can find a connection between time series features and the performance of temporal aggregation. So let's start by um, talking about why we need temporal aggregation and what are the common approaches. So as uh, obviously all of us here, we know um, we use time series forecasting to inform uh, decisions. And decisions are generally made at multiple levels um, of operational, tactical or strategic. So corresponding to short term forecasting, mid-term forecasting or long-term um, forecasting. And so the decision that we're trying to inform by the forecast will determine, develop the forecast that we need to generate. So that's this, the, the thing that we, we're trying to understand here. And then following that, of course, there are different approaches 
to generate the forecast there. So the fundamental thing to understand here is we need to generate forecast at various um, level of temporal granularity. Now, the thing is, forecasting time granularity level and the horizon that corresponds to that, so are determined by decision made in the light of the forecast. So we have already mentioned that, but one common assumption is, is the time series granularity uh, match the forecast requirement. So if you need to produce the daily forecast, we use the daily time series to do that. However, the level of time series granularity doesn't necessarily match the level of forecast granularity, right? So we could have a time series um, data that, uh, that is more granular or less granular than the forecast requirement. So the level of the temporal granularity in the forecast could be lower than the existing time series granularity. Um, and this is quite common, you know, nowadays with advances in data collection technology and IT. So we record the data, at the, the famous temporal granularity, for example, like point of sales or arrival time uh, in hospitals. So it is something that happens. So uh, if, for example, a forecast uh, is required, let's say at the annual level, and then uh, you need uh, to generate the forecast at that level, but the, the time series that you get is the monthly level. So you need to figure out basically how to generate that forecast. So now th these are the, the important things that we need to understand why we talk about temporal aggregation, right? Because we have a time series at a um, higher level of uh, granularity. And then we have the forecast, which is different from that. Of course, we may have cases where these two are matched, so that's not a problem at all, right? Well, we can also talk, argue that temporal aggregation still could be, could be helpful in the cases like that. Uh, but if these two matches, then this is, um, this is basically uh, uh, so, at least the way I look at things here, but uh, later on I will also look at some, uh, some other approach as well. Even if you have the same granularity, uh, sometimes temp temporal aggregation might be beneficial. So the problem that we are considering, at least in these two papers and in this study, um, is we consider a time series forecasting problem where an initial time series has a higher temporal granularity, like a monthly, which could be daily, and then the required forecast is annual. But again, um, if the time series granularity is daily, the forecast requirement could be, for example, at weekly level, right? So we have a time series uh, granularity with a higher temporal um, we have a time series with a higher temporal granularity, right? That's the, the assumptions that I have. And what we need to do is we need to generate a forecast for the total value over a number of time periods ahead. And we call this uh, forecast over lead time or forecast horizon aggregation, right? So this is different from generating a forecast per period. Here, we aim at generating forecasts for the whole number of periods that we are interested in, which might be common in many, um, uh, many organizations, uh, in particular in supply chain. We know that if you, you are interested in producing the forecast uh, for the lead time to be used to calculate safety stock or for a replenishment, so you may need the forecast over that lead time period. So that's what we are focusing on here. So a key question here to answer is, should the original time series be used to generate the forecast for that particular horizon, right? So if let's say the lead time is um, 12 months, so you first generate the forecast for every month, and then you sum them up to obtain the forecast over the horizon. So we call this aggregate forecast, or should we first aggregate the time series to match the forecast requirement granularity, and then extrapolate directly at that level. And we call this aggregate data. 
And then I will illustrate these approaches using a, a simple example later on. So one thing we should note here, uh, there is no disaggregation mechanism um, to generate the forecast um, at the original time granularity. So when we generate the forecast over lead time, we now we don't break it down again to go back to the original level. All right, so that's that's something we need to know as well. All right, OK, so now um, just some terminologies to make sure uh, we are uh, all in the same page. So when we talk about one time series, we may talk about data time granularity or forecast time granularity. So these two may match or not, but it is important to know what we're talking about. We have a forecast horizon, which again is the granularity uh, of the forecast with the number of periods ahead that we are interested in. And then when we talk about forecast horizon aggregation or lead time, here we talk about the, the whole period together, so uh, not per period. So for example, here we talk about one week, one quarter, or one year. And when I talk about temporal aggregation, so I consider two different approaches. So um, we either aggregate forecast, we may call this bottom up as well. So in my slides later on, if you see AF or BU, so where I'm referring to aggregating forecast, and then we may also aggregate data. And if we aggregate data, you may do it in two different ways. Uh, using either non-overlapping temporal aggregation or overlapping temporal aggregation. So these are the terminologies that I'm, I may use later, and we need to be aware of them. Okay, now let's demonstrate these um, approaches to generate the forecast for the forecast horizon using this simple example, right? So we have a monthly time series, and uh, we want to forecast for the next quarter using um, the first approach, which is aggregated forecast. And here, let's assume we just use a naive method, but it could be any, any method, right? So what happens is we uh, generate the forecast for the next three periods, and then we add them up, right? And that would be the forecast outcome of um, aggregated forecast approach or bottom-up approach. Now, we can also um, do the non-overlapping temporal aggregation. So again, in non-overlapping temporal aggregation, we start by dividing the original time series into a non-overlapping block of uh, bucket of time. So we have blocks here, basically, right? And the size of each block is equal to um, what we call the aggregation level, which all, which can correspond to uh, the lead time in our example. So the number of periods, for example, is three in this case. Uh, so it 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 means the lead time is three months, for example. All right. So we convert or transform the initial time series that we have using non-overlapping temporal aggregation. Um, into a new time series, which is called non-overlapping temporally aggregated series. Right, so we split the time series from the last observation backward. That's how we do it. And then we sum up the, the values or the measurement that we have for the time series, and that would become basically the value for each period of the non-overlapping temporally aggregated series. So this is the, the process to follow to convert an original time series into a non-overlapping temporal aggregation series. So this is how we aggregate data in this case. And as you can see, this approach if, is applied to the original time series. And by doing this, actually, we lose some information. So number of periods that we get in non-overlapping temporal aggregation are um, lower than the original one. So generally is uh, an integer part of the total number of observation we have in the original one um, divided by the aggregation level. So that's, that would be the total number of observations we get 
in the aggregated time series. So what happens next? Well, we forecast for the next uh, period, just one step ahead, and that would be uh, basically the forecast that we get from the non-overlapping temporal aggregation, right? So here we forecast using um, aggregate forecast for three periods and then we sum up, but here we first convert to get a non-overlapping temporal aggregated series and then we forecast only for one step ahead. And these two forecasts are comparable now. So we can also uh, aggregate data using overlapping temporal aggregation. So in this case, um, instead of having a um, bucket of times they are uh, not overlap, we have the bucket of times they are overlapped. But the size of this bucket is equal to at the aggregation level, so same as non-overlapping temporal aggregation. So the difference is uh, we don't overlap this bucket of times. But the concept is very similar, so we start from the last, oops, sorry, the last observation. We divide the original time series into bucket of times that are um, overlapped. And then we sum up the measurements inside these buckets and then we create now a new time series that you see at the bottom. So this is um, overlapping temporally aggregated series. And then now we apply the forecasting method that we have and we generate the forecast for one step ahead. And now we can compare the forecast generated by aggregated forecasts or aggregated data by both non-overlapping and overlapping temporal aggregation. Well, so um, these three approaches that I discussed so far, they are um, considering only forecasting at, at one single level. OK, so um, but uh, there are also um, approaches proposed in the literature that can benefit from uh, combining forecasts generated at multiple time granularities. So the approach uh, proposed by uh, by Nikos uh, Fotio San Juan in this paper is uh, one of this approach that is named as MAPA. So instead of just looking at one single level of granularity, they use the information available at multiple level of granularities and somehow they combine it. Um, there is also another approach uh, with the same concept uh, of, of the MAPA, which is temporal hierarchies. Uh, so here we have basically a hierarchy from the bottom uh, to the top from annual, for example. So annual could be breakdown into semi-annual, the quarter or the, or the month, or annual could be break it down to fourth month and then bi-monthly, and then at the bottom you have monthly. And again, the idea here is to generate the forecast at all these levels and then somehow combine them, right? So these two approaches uh, are very helpful uh, because they benefit from aggregating uh, from the information available at multiple levels. Uh, that's one thing. And the second thing is they help also with um, coherency. So you can have, because you know that the, we are making multiple decisions and multiple decisions are generally made by different people in the organization. But if we can use an approach like temporal hierarchy, then we can also, um, you know, coordinate between generating forecasts at these different levels. But in this, the, the rest of the presentation and these two papers that I'm talking about, I'm focusing on generating the forecast at single level. And but these ideas could be generated to both MAPA and temporal hierarchies as well. OK, now let's go back to the. Um, I mean, the simple question that we asked before. And whether we should use aggregated data or aggregated forecast. Based on what I have uh, observed in, in practice and also, you know, some textbooks uh, recommendations, it is quite common to recommend to aggregate data and then forecast when you have a time series history that is recorded at a high frequency time granularity 
and you need the forecast at a lower level. So if you have a time series, let's say at monthly, and you need uh, to generate the forecast at annual level, it, often it is recommended to first convert your time series to the annual level and then generate the forecast. Uh, for example, you can read about this as well in, uh, in, in the book Profit from Your Forecasting Software, in page 153 that is, uh, that is recommended. So the first thing I want to do is I want to examine basically this, this sort of things like what, uh, what is the performance of aggregating data versus aggregating forecast um, if I use the M4 um, competition data. So now let's let's talk about how temporal aggregation perform on this M4 competition data. So again, I suppose most of you, you are familiar with uh, and competition data sets. So we have um, quarterly, monthly, daily, and hourly data, but in my work, I haven't looked at the hourly data set in M4 competition. Um, and I also extracted um, 42 features from this data sets, uh, but again, I'm not going to discuss the description of these features in detail. If you are interested, you can just, um, you know, Google basically this package in R and you can find the description of this. But in the paper, I can share the paper later with uh, with Ivan and you as well. Um, so I provide a description of this, but in the presentation, um, I, I don't have them. No. All right, so, uh, we, so we have different um, time granularities in M4 completion data, and we extract different features as well. So I use simple, uh, I use exponential smoothing state space model and ERIMA, but I present mainly the result of exponential smoothing here, um, and, and not ERIMA, but the conclusions are similar. And I um, evaluate the point forecast accuracy using um, MACE and RMSSE, uh, but we have, uh, done the experiment with many more features, so, and we are going to share this uh, in a shiny application, so readers can also investigate different things by uh, looking at the shiny application. And we have conducted or performed time series cross validation here. So I don't know if you are familiar with the features of um, M4 competition data, but I thought it might be helpful just briefly look at the features of the M4 competition data. And here I just again present uh, the monthly time series features. Um, so in, in this plot, basically what we see in the Y axis is the number of time series and what we see in X axis is the features extracted by um, that package that I mentioned in R for each feature. So these are the values for each feature in X axis. And then here you see the name of the feature. It's like a curvature, nonlinearity, um, seasonal, PACF, unit root, etc. So some of these features are actually easy to understand and we can, you know, uh, interpret them as well, but some might be difficult um, to, to really understand them. For example, uh, well, everybody um, understands what is a mean or what is a coefficient of variation, but it might be hard to understand what is an arch, um, for example, that LM, right? Um, but what is important to, to highlight in terms of the time series features that we see in monthly um, M4 competition is, um, for example, let me see, yeah, so here you see the seasonal strengths. So as you can see, the majority of the time series, so first of all, this is the skewed you now to the right, so we can see clearly that most of time series, they have a seasonality strength that is very close uh, to zero. So it means this time series, uh, the, at least the majority of them, they are not highly seasonal. And if you look at um, another feature like trend, actually you can see that trend is skewed to the left. So most of the time series 
uh, in monthly M4 computation are uh, trended. But again, uh, you can look at, for example, another, another feature like entropy, which determines how easy or difficult it is to forecast a time series. So when entropy, and it is the ratio of signal to noise, when it is close to one, it, it means it's hard. When it's close to zero, it means um, it's easier. And you can see you now there is also um, a range from zero to one uh, for the monthly time series. Uh, and also, if you look at one of the autocorrelation, for example, measures, for example, if again, this is a, a seasonality measure, it's, um, it's like a log normal distribution actually centered around zero. Again, indicating um, most of time series, uh, they, they are not seasonal. Um, I just wanted to look at one autocorrelation, for example, feature. Uh, ACF1, which, yeah, so for example here, so you see the, the autocorrelation. The autocorrelation lag one is very high for most of the time series. And so this one is the sum of square of 10 first autocorrelation legs. And again, you see that there is a range from uh, like very small to very high. So it means the autocorrelation um, for the first 10 legs is not always highly positive, but this is the case for the XACF. So, this M4 com competition data and, and monthly M4 competition data, well, has different features and uh, it might be interesting also to see how these approaches work when we have these different time series features. All right, so the first thing that I'm presenting here is what I call the percentage best, is the percentage of time each approach, bottom up or aggregate forecast, so remember A, a, F and B, U, they are the same. And then we have aggregate data, both non-overlapping and overlapping. So in X axis, I show the percentage of time each approach um, is the best. When we forecast at bi-monthly, quarterly, four-monthly, semi-annual and annual. And here, well, the, I didn't separate the plot, but we have both ARIMA and ETS. And as you can see, for the majority of cases, aggregating forecast actually is more accurate than aggregated data. And then that in terms of aggregate data, somehow is it split between non-overlapping and overlapping. And here, the error measure uh, I use is MACE. Well, this plot shows the performance of aggregated forecast versus um, uh, aggregated demand. And then here I just plotted the non-overlapping temporal aggregation. And again, the, the box plot shows um, how the performance changes from going to bi-monthly to annual. And you see um, the difference when we forecast the annual for using aggregate forecast or aggregate data. Uh, and this is the, the level where we see the highest difference. And then later on in the question where I want to investigate the link or the connection between time series features and the performance of these two approaches, I use actually the data only from the annual level. And I will explain the algorithm, but maybe this is something uh, we need to note as well. All right, so basically, mm, what do these two plots um, tell us? And of course, in the paper, I have um, more plots, you know, for uh, other time granularities, but you see more or less the same sort of patterns for quarterly and for daily time series as well. Right, so basically what we understand from this is, well, these approaches, maybe they have their own merit, because they perform well in different time series. And remember, the percentage base was calculated based on the individual time series. 
And of course, this one, the box plot as well, is constructed based on uh, the individual time series, right? So it is not just an overall accuracy, right? So when we look at the performance of these approaches at the individual time series level, we see that they may perform, um, they, they may outperform each other. And this is where uh, I started asking these two questions, whether combining forecasts generated by bottom-up, uh, non-overlapping and overlapping may improve the forecast accuracy, and then how we might combine them. And then the second question that they asked was how data temporal aggregation changes time series features, and is there any association between these features and the performance of aggregated data versus aggregated forecasts? Now, so let's um, look at the first question and see what we have um, find out. So sorry for the, the font uh, I, um, is quite uh, small, uh, so I didn't have time to, to correct this. But what happens is we have designed an experiment to answer the first question, right? So we have a time series, and then for that time series, I just extracted whether um, there is a trend or seasonality, and this is done using ETS, whether ETS identify a, a non or uh, um, a trend or a seasonality pattern, whether additive or multiplicative, right? So that's the first thing we have done. And following that, we created non-overlapping and overlapping temporal aggregation. So we just transformed the series. Then we generated the forecast using the original time series for M step ahead and one step ahead for overlapping and non-overlapping. So now we have three forecasts generated by bottom-up or aggregate forecast, then two forecasts generated by non-overlapping and overlapping temporal aggregation. And then from there, we tried to combine this forecast by a simple average forecast and by um, another algorithm. So again, this algorithm takes these three uh, approaches and combine them. At the end, we compare the performance of these uh, five approaches. So here we have initially three approaches and then two approaches from the combination. So the, this combination, right, we call it MLP, um, is done based on the paper based on Cesar Bianchi et al. And the algorithm basically is described here, but what this algorithm does simply is a um, weighting combination. So um, each we have three approaches, bottom up, non-overlapping and overlapping. So each approach they, they have a weight and the weight will be updated based on the performance observed in the previous periods uh, and based on the loss observed in those periods, right? So is it the weighting system and the weight will be updated based on what has been observed. And this is of course based on the uh, performance in the out of sample. This table summarizes the result for um, basically the experiment that I just show you in the diagram. And what we, we observe is, um, and this is for monthly time series only, uh, what we observe is actually this forecast combi combination of bottom up overlapping and non overlapping uh, can improve the forecast accuracy. And the improvement is substantial when we forecast at annual level, as you, as you can see from here, for the bimonthly, um, the bottom-up approach is a slightly better, right? So this is basically what um, we observed. Of course, we have done also similar things for quarterly and daily. And in both cases, we see some sort of similar patterns. So as we go from, let's say, um, higher frequency to lower frequency, MLP performance improves. Uh, but always um, in the 
horizons like very close to the initial time series horizon bottom up performs better than the aggregation approaches. All right. Now let's move on to the second question where we talk about um, the link between time series features and the performance of temporal aggregation approaches. So to answer the second question, we design again another experiment. So here we have the original time series. Uh, we have done this for both not overlapping and overlapping, but um, I haven't explored the result for overlapping. So what I present here is just for non-overlapping temporal aggregation. So I have the original series and then I converted them or transformed them to the non-overlapping temporal aggregated series using different aggregation level from bi-monthly to annual. And then we extract the time series features for both original time series and temporally aggregated series. We then forecast using ETS for the aggregated forecast and aggregated data approaches. Of course, here we have one uh, step ahead forecast, but here we have to forecast for MS step ahead and then sum them up to get the aggregated forecast. And then we calculate the forecast accuracy. Here we used um, RMSSE. And then following that, we constructed a new data set. What is this new data set? For each time series in monthly time series, we have 12 columns or variables corresponding to features, right? That I show you in the monthly time series, so 42 features. And then we have an outcome or a target column that says for that particular um, time series with this set of features, which approach uh, performed better? So either is AF or AD. So basically, we turn uh, the problem into a classification prediction problem. So we have a set of features and we have a response or outcome which is either AD or AF. And from there, we tested various machine learning approaches to identify, first of all, which approach can predict accurately uh, whether aggregated forecasts or aggregated data performs well given a set of measures, measures right? And then following that, um, if the algorithm also can help us with some indications on which time series feature may impact the performance of these approaches. So this is what, uh, what we have done basically in the experiment design. Now, before actually looking at the result, um, it would be interesting to look at uh, this plots and to understand how non-overlapping temporal aggregation change time series features. So let me um, explain how these points are calculated. Well, first of all, in the x-axis, we have different time granularities from monthly to annual, what we call them aggregation level here. And so at each aggregation level, we have 48,000 time series in the monthly data, right? So initially I tried to visualize using a density plot or a box plot, and then see how going from monthly to annual changes the characteristics, but because most of um, these data points they had outliers, it was very difficult to see any interesting things. So what I did is, for each level, uh, I'm sorry, for the initial level in monthly, so I calculated the features, and then I categorized the features into four categories based on the quantiles. So from zero to 25%, from 25% to 50%, from 50% to 75%, and then from 75% up to 100. So we have four categories. 
and I named them very low, low, high, and very high. Okay, so very low is 0 to 25%, and very high is 75% to 100. And then I calculated the mean of the futures for each category, and this point represents the mean of the futures. And I tracked basically each features and each category, how that changes um, as we increase the aggregation level, so going from monthly to the annual. And then we see some, some really interesting behaviors, and some of them, you know, you may know them, we expect them as well, but some might be also surprising. For example, if you look at the curvature, so what happens is we see that the curvature tends to become close to zero as we aggregate, right? What about nonlinearity? Nonlinearity increases as we aggregate from monthly to um, annual. Mean increases, at least I know I have done it correctly because otherwise I, I, I will be surprised if mean decreases. So uh, the mean increases as we go from monthly to, uh, to annual. Linearity again, it becomes close to zero. It's less um, linear. If you look at, for example, um, something like um, seasonal strength, um, again, we cannot calculate it at annual level, but we see that there is a reduction in seasonal strength as we go from monthly to toward higher aggregation level. Uh, autocorrelation is reducing as well as we go from monthly uh, to annual, so you can see the reduction in both autocorrelation lag one and uh, the sum square of the uh, first 10 autocorrelation. Um, well, with trend, uh, we see that the trend increases, the strengths of trend increases, but then we see this strange behavior at the end. And actually, we see this sort of strange behaviors um, somehow in some of these features. The, the explanation I may have for this might be because, uh, for example, seasonality might not be, um, so we don't calculate it at annual level. Uh, so this may somehow impact it some calculations, they may use the seasonality to calculate the other features as well. And so that, that's what I, I thought might be, but it could be for different reasons as well. So um, one interesting thing that we observe here is, is the entropy. So you remember entropy, if it's close to one, it means the time series is difficult to forecast. And if it close to zero, it is easy. So here, what we, we see is if the entropy is uh, close to zero in monthly, that increases um, we, as we go to the annual. So it means the time series becomes um, a bit more difficult to forecast at annual level if it is uh, easy here. But if the entropy is high, well, it, change, it doesn't change dramatically, but it reduces a little bit uh, and it becomes um, a bit easier uh, to forecast, which is again something interesting to observe here. So here we, we just look at how uh, non-overlapping temporal aggregation change time series features. Now let me also show you this figure. And this figure basically um, look at the relationship between different features that we extracted for the monthly time series and different colors tell us which uh, because each point here is one time series, right? So each Mahima. point, yeah. Uh, can you start wrapping up, actually? Yeah, all right. So, um, okay, so the, the, so this plot tells us um, is is really difficult uh, to distinguish the performance of AD from AF, right? Um, because there is no like clear boundary between when AD or AF uh, performs well. It is, it is not, for example, easy. It is not linear. So the decision is not a uh, boundary. Is, um, the boundary is not linear. OK, so um, we look at the different classifiers using machine learning model. Random forest performs the best in terms of predicting AD or AF uh, given the set of 
time series features that we discuss here. And in terms of the, the most important features, so we identified curvature, nonlinearity, seasonal PACF, unit root, which is something related to time series being stationary or not. Um, arc LM, still I don't understand it, so I need to understand what is this feature. Uh, coefficient of variation, stability, and linearity is the most important indicators that help random forests to predict accurately whether AF or AD performs better. And of course, here we use also some other measures like misclassification or if statistics and random forest was the best. So this is the final plot that I show you, which is a partial dependence plot. Basically, this partial dependence plot help us to um, understand the indications of or the connection between the time series features and um, the performance of AD and, A, uh, and AF. So in the y-axis, what we have is a probability of aggregated forecast. And then in y-axis and x-axis, we have the time series features. And then you see some some you know rugs here as well that um, indicate how dense the, the the number of those features are, right? Again, I'm not going to look at all of them, um, but some of these features are very interesting. So, for example, if you look at nonlinearity, as nonlinearity increases, the probability of aggregated forecast. Be, be uh, being better than aggregated demand decreases, right? So this is something we can clearly see here. For example, in, in the in curvature, what we what we observe is um, as um, uh, sorry in the in the arch LM, what we observe is as we go from zero to one, this increases the probability of AF being better increases as well. Uh, for example, if you look at something like um, trend here, as trend increases, the probability of, again, aggregated forecast uh, becomes better than aggregated demand increases. So basically, this partial uh, dependence plot are a very helpful tool to understand how time series features are linked uh, to the performance of AF and AI. So to summarize, um, well, as I said, uh, in practice, I have seen this, that people recommend using um, aggregated data when you have a time series in high frequency and you need a forecast at low frequency. So our result in shows that this might not be always true and both approaches, they may have their own merit. And we understand that combining aggregated data and aggregate forecast can improve the forecast accuracy. And also uh, in the plus, we show clearly how different uh, features are changed by applying, by transforming the data to a non-overlapping temporal aggregated series. And um, we also um, understand the most important features um, to predict accurately whether AF or AD works better, and we identified um, curvature, nonlinearity, seasonal PACF, unit root, mean, arch LM, coefficient of variation, stability, linearity, and max level as the most important or top 10 features. And finally, we observed also by increasing trend, um, arc LM, Hearst, autocorrelation lag one, unit root, and seasonal PACF, the chance of AF or aggregated forecast performing better increases. And increasing lumpiness, entropy, nonlinearity, curvature, and seasonality increases the chance of aggregated data performing better um, comparing to the AF. So these are two work on the progress. So these are also two papers that we have published recently. Um, and then some references for um, forecasting by temporal aggregation. And I'm, I will share the slides also later on my website. 
And then again, you can check out my own website and uh, connect on Twitter and, and LinkedIn as well. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Bachmann, for exciting presentation. I've asked uh, Juan Ramon Trapero uh, to provide some comments and discussion for the talk. And I see that Juan has exactly the same background as Bachmann has. So Juan, over to you if you have any questions or thoughts. Okay, can you hear me well? Yes, yeah, yeah. we can. Perfect. Well, uh, first of all, let me thank all of you. Let me thank Ivan and the Lancaster Center for Forecasting and Marketing Analytics for inviting me. And thanks as well, Batman, for your very nice and very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I have a, a couple of comments and I would like to have as well a couple of questions. I think that we are on time. In case that uh, <laughs> I extend myself, just let me know, Ivan. Uh, I think that the, the, one of the strength points of this work, I think, is the, that you put the focus on the issue of overlapping and non-overlapping. I think that uh, most of us, we have read papers about supply chain demand forecasting that we are not really sure about how the lead time demand is computing. Are they using the overlapping or, or the non-overlapping? So maybe something that uh, someone who is starting to work on this uh, kind of problem does not uh, uh, understand the importance of defining if you are using the overlapping or the non-overlapping. So here you put uh, some, some uh, attention on that, to pay attention on that, and I think it's, it's remarkable. Uh, I also really like how the, the slide 10, well, where you put an example and you define, you put the differences between overlapping and non-overlapping, I think it's totally clear here. And I think it's also a, a very, very interesting and the experiments are, are quite exhaustive uh, as well. Uh, I have now a, a, a few questions. The first question um, is about, I still, I am going to ask you about the overlapping use issue and, and, and my questions are going to be related to that. Um, because uh, sometimes we are uh, focusing on should we use the overlapping or non-overlapping in terms of forecasting accuracy. But I think that we have to see uh, how these forecasts are going to be used. For instance, if we are uh, focusing on supply chain management, most of the forecasts are intended to improve the, the stock control. So I think that uh, when you have a, a, a periodic review stock control, a typical RS uh, stock control, you can use a, a non-overlapping. But if you have a continuous review system where you can uh, make orders uh, in every period, I think that you need the non-overlapping uh, technique. What do you think about this comment that uh, I said? Do you think, is, does it make any sense <laughs> what I said? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, first of all, um, I I agree this, I mean, the, the, the presentation that I make here and uh, the question that I look at here is something very relevant to lead time forecasting. So basically one assumptions that I make here is you have a lead time or a lead time plus a review system, um, and then you want to generate a forecast for the whole period, right? So, and I assume that the aggregation level that you choose will match that period, basically. Yes. So that's, that's one assumption I, I make. But then for me, if I want to generate that forecast, Overlapping or non-overlapping, it doesn't make any any difference because at the end of the day, if I have a lead time that is three months or three months plus one four months, well, I will generate the forecast for the total uh, period over the four months. So I don't really see how overlapping or non-overlapping might be different in generating that forecast. But also, you remember the these problems are could be outside supply chains as well, wherever. You have a time series that is um, more um, disaggregated or the time granularity is higher. Uh, even if it's not supply chain, you still need to forecast from daily to uh, weekly or from hourly to. So you have a daily time series. You want 
uh, a weekly forecast, you have an hourly time series, you want a daily forecast, you have a monthly time series, you have a uh, annual forecast. So, and these problems are everywhere. Wherever data is recorded at a higher level of frequency, then this is um, applicable. But in supply chain, yeah, it is a problem related to lead time forecasting. But then I don't see how overlapping or non overlapping would be different. OK, OK. Um, another question that I have, uh, because when it's very related to the temporal hierarchies, uh, I always uh, struggle to know how can you use this kind of method uh, to compute probabilistic forecasts? Because when you aggregate at the end, and we are going to use engineering terms, uh, you are uh, filtering the high frequency components that are usually related to noise. So you extract the low uh, frequency the, related to the, to the trend, and usually it works well when you have to do a long term uh, forecasting horizon. When you have to forecast at long term, it usually works well. But uh, when you have to, uh, to uh, produce a probabilistic forecast, uh, the, the higher frequency data, imagine that you have hourly or daily, is where you can get uh, the most variability. So when you aggregate, this variability can be lost. Uh, how do you think uh, you can modify your approach to include, maybe you are including right now uh, and I, <laughs> I didn't consider it, but how do you uh, modify or how can you compute probabilistic forecast, the whole density of the forecast uh, using your, your approach? Or? Well, to be, um, you know, I'm doing an empirical work currently on, on uh, just the impact and prediction intervals and I want to extend it onto that uh, as well, but my understanding is, again, it, it depends. For example, uh, if you do consider um, a distribution, let's say, a normal distribution at different level of the hierarchy, then um, combining, for example, this might, might not be uh, problematic because you can end up having a normal distribution, let's say. Yes. But then if it is a different way of generating the probabilistic forecast, uh, then uh, I don't know. I mean, theoretically, I don't know how this is not an area that I have worked on, so I don't know how that translates theoretically. But I think empirically, this is something that, you know, that could be done. But again, you the aggregation level that you choose, um, uh, for example, you can go from the, the 24 hours to one day and from one day to seven days so in this way you can aggregate things properly from hourly to weekly and i think empirically you should be able to generate uh, the forecast um, but if you consider the, like a temporal hierarchies and the, the theory behind it i think this is an area where i'm um, I, i'm not very knowledgeable and uh, i don't know how to do it uh, but uh, I think it is an interesting area. I'm, I'm not aware of actually uh, work in this area as well, so this might be something important to, to focus on. Yes, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, because as you said, when you aggregate, in the end, you can use the, the central theory, the, lim the central limit theory, that every, everything gets normal. But the variability, the variability, I think it is the key because at, low, at the lower level, you know, at the high frequency data, the variability is much higher. When you aggregate, you remove that variability. So once you have removed that variability, you cannot get it back. So I think maybe with the variability, it doesn't work in the same way that the mean. But it's just my intuition. I, I don't have any evidence of that. It's just the, the way I wanted to. Yeah. to you. And I, I totally agree that. We need uh, to do more research on this because it's not a, an easy question, as, as you have shown there. Yes. I mean, it's I mean, it's interesting when you say variability because it it uh, it's important how you quantify that because if you look at this, I don't know if you still see my uh, yes, yes my screen, but then for example, coefficient of variation, as you can see, it decreases um, as you go from monthly to annual. Right, so if you consider this as a hierarchy, you know, from bottom to, to top of the temporal hierarchy, then this is what we see. But then if I look at the entropy, 
as a measure of um, variability or how difficult it is or I don't know uncertainty whatever uh, so you, you see a bit different things here so uh, something but, but again this is something related to variability because here we have noise uh, and signal yes yes so uh, again I think it's important to to highlight, you know, when you say variability, maybe yeah, something like uh, coefficient of variation actually decreases, uh, and as you can as you can see it in monthly level, you, if you have a higher uh, coefficient of variation, it reduces as you go to the annual level. Yeah, yes, that, that that's a good point actually. Yes, because variability is related to uncertainty, but it's not the same. So the way that you define that is, is obviously. Uh, important and uh, well I think that that's, those were my questions uh, I mean I have a maybe a, 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 a new comment but uh, I would like to let the rest of people ask questions as well so uh, <laughs> I'm finished uh, by now <laughs> thank you very much Juan thank you thank you thank you Juan for the comments uh, so we ran out of time, but I will ask a question from the audience. Uh, the question is the temporal aggregation seems to be some sort of filtering actually what uh, Juan said. So is there a validation method to measure the loss of information when you uh, aggregate? Well, I don't know if there is a method, but I think these plots actually show what happens to, yeah. to those information. Uh, and that's, that's uh, yeah, so um, different, it's not always a loss actually, so I don't know what we mean by loss, but uh, you know, the, 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 the features change, you know, as we aggregate, so uh, some sometimes you may lose things, so if you have uh, maybe, let me see if I can, uh, so for example, uh, seasonality or autocorrelation, so yeah, if you consider this as a loss, you, you get less autocorrelated time series, for example, but it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. But yeah, definitely it is the filtering things and it, I think, I don't know if I understood the question, it, does it mean if you have um, like theory that help us to understand how the information is filtered out and how we can quantify the loss of information, is that the question? Yeah, I guess that's uh, something yeah. like that. I think, I mean, I tried here to answer the question with the empirical data, mm -hmm. with the, with this monthly M4 data, but I suppose there might be a theory behind this, this sort of thing. Okay, right, so it's time to end. Thanks a lot uh, for the presentation, Bachman. Thank you, Juan, for your comments. And uh, thank everyone for attending. See you all in two weeks. Thank you. Bye-bye.